I invite your attention to the book of Acts, chapter 13. I'll meet you there in just a moment. I want to say how glad I am to see you again tonight. And I have prepared a very special lesson for tonight. You know, I got to looking in my files and someone suggested that I preach a sermon about the grace of God. And I looked in my files and I found my folder that said grace and there was one sermon in there. So ever since 2007, when I graduated school, I have only preached one sermon about the grace of God. And I thought to myself, I have desperately failed as a preacher of the gospel. <laughs> so I thought, you know what, I'm going to prepare something brand new, something I've never preached before. As I studied this subject, I really had my eyes open to the grace of God. Let's begin in Acts chapter 13 tonight. While you're turning there, I'm reminded of a story about the building of the Golden Gate Bridge in 1938. The workers were working hard, they were making good progress, but they had some delays because several men fell to their deaths while they were working on this bridge. So they had to come up with an idea, you know, there's no way that they could make good progress if they were scared that people would die. So they began to put a net under where they were building. That way, if someone fell, they would know that they would be safe and they would be all right. You know, God's grace is the net for us when we fall. And because of that net, because of the grace that they were offered in 1938 while building that bridge, we have a great, beautiful structure here for us today. You see, God is taking us from point A to point B. And eventually he's going to take us to heaven. But, you know, there's something that's got to happen in between there. There's got to be some growth that I need to have in order for me to get to where God wants me to go. In order for that growth to take place, God has to extend to us his wonderful, amazing, matchless grace. Look here in Acts chapter 13 and verse 43. It says, Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and the proselytes, they followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, they persuaded them, notice, to continue in the grace of God. I hope tonight if there's anything I can say to you, it's to continue in the grace of God. Because the very moment that we leave the church, we turn our backs on the Lord, we turn our backs on salvation. I want to tell you, friend, we turn our backs on the grace of God. So we want to continue in that. You look in Acts chapter 15, just two more chapters ahead. It says, we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. We continue in grace. We're saved by grace. And in Acts chapter 20 and verse 32, he said, Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Tonight, let's talk about that inheritance. The building up of grace. How do we build such a wonderful structure that God says is, is worthy? We've got to have a net while we're building. And that net is the grace of God. Is the grace of God. There was a man who visited his friend in Alabama for the first time. He was, he was a northerner, you know. And Anyway, he visited Alabama for the first time. They went out to a, a fancy restaurant. It was a fish camp. <laughs> and at the fancy restaurant, the fish camp, where they had fried fish, the man received something on his plate that he had never seen before. It was white, sort of mushy, he said, what in the world is this on my plate? The waiter said, sir, you must not be from the south. That is grits. <laughs> he said, hold on, ma'am. Let me tell you something. He said, look, I don't even know what that is. I didn't order it and I don't want to pay for it. She said, well, you're going to learn something in the south. You don't have to order it. You don't have to pay for it. You just get it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought about that story. I, I thought about how God's grace affects everyone. At least it should. It's offered to everyone. You know, in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, he said, The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. You see, you don't, you don't pay for it. 
You don't order it, you just get it. It's just part of the plan. You know, God has, has offered it to every single person. But, there's a little disclaimer that we find in John chapter 1. Because not everybody receives God's grace. You know, he began the chapter, you remember in John chapter 1, he said, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. But then you come down to verse 14, and he said, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Now notice, full of grace. And truth. You say, well, preacher, what, is it, what do you mean by that? Jesus was full of grace and truth. Well, you look there in verse 17, and he said, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That means to me that Jesus, when he came into the world, he brought something special. He, he brought something that was different. Because no matter how hard they tried, the law of Moses, the Old Testament Jewish system, it could not build the Golden Gate Bridge. It only brought them to where the grace was being offered. And be thankful tonight that you don't have to be a part of that old system. You can be blessed not to be Jewish, but to be a Christian. To say that God's grace has been offered to me and I have accepted this beautiful gift. So that's the introduction for my lesson tonight. Somebody said this, if you work, you get a wage. If you're in a competition, you get a prize. For recognition, you get an award. But if you don't deserve a wage or a prize or an award and you get a gift anyway, that's grace. That's what grace is, friend. It's free. You can't work to obtain it. You can't be some special person just to get it. You see, God just gives it. That's the beautiful creator that God is. Let's talk about God's amazing grace tonight from Romans chapter 5. So I invite your attention there. If, if you have your Bibles with you, I hope that you do. And we're going to notice 11 verses tonight. In Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11 is to me one of the most beautiful scriptures about God's grace that you find in the Bible. You see, we're going to talk about the power of God's grace. We're going to talk about the price of God's grace. We're going to talk about the promise of His grace. And we'll talk about the prize of His grace all here in these 11 verses. Now, let's begin verse 1 through 5 and talk about the power of grace. Here's what he says. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein you stand and you rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because of the love of God which is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. It's interesting to me that in the scriptures, anytime you read anything about the Holy Spirit, it always has something to do with some kind of powerful thing. And in this instance, the powerful thing that is mentioned, of course, is the grace of God. He says, we stand in His grace. Now, there's some key words because of this power. For instance, the power of God's grace has justified us. The power of God's grace has given us peace. It causes us to rejoice. It gives us hope. It shows us about the love of God. Now, I don't even know any other way to describe it, to make it any more powerful than that. To me, the apostle knew exactly what he was doing when he's describing the power of God's grace. In the late 1800s, there was a preacher who was, he was walking and he saw a little boy carrying a jug of milk and you know, back in those times, the milk jugs were glass. And a boy tripped and fell, and that, that pitcher broke. It went all over the road, and the milk was spilled everywhere. And the little boy was crying, and that preacher went over there, and he said, Son, are you okay? The boy told him how upset he was, because now he was going to get into trouble. So the preacher took him back to his house, and he said, I'll tell you what, I, I got a brand new pitcher that will we'll fill it up. So that preacher got that new pitcher, 
took him back to the store, filled that thing up with milk, and he carried the little boy this time. He carried him right to his front door, and he set him down. He gave him the pitcher of milk. He said, you going to get in trouble? The boy smiled. He said, no, because we got a better pitcher now. <laughs> it's even better than it was before, Fred. You see, that's what God does with people's lives. You know, he gives them an opportunity. It's an opportunity to grow in the grace of God. Now, that is powerful because as humans, you know what we tend to do? We want to suppress people when they do wrong. We say, oh, okay. Let that person cross me one more time. I'll show them what I think about them. But it's interesting to me that when Peter came out of the boat to walk on the water to go to Jesus, he began to sink because he was fearful and afraid. And the Bible says immediately Jesus reached forth his hand and caught him. You know, if it were us, if we saw someone fail, we say, oh, he's just weak. Let's just tell him, tell him how weak he is. And maybe he'll get stronger in the future. You see, that's not how God operates. You see, because God gives people an opportunity not only to see the wrong that they've done, but to fix it and to move on in the future. He justifies them even in the midst of their wrong. We'll talk about that in just a minute. I'll give you two scriptures and then I'm going to move on. Ephesians 3, 7, he said, Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God. And that's exactly what grace is. It is a gift. It was given to me by the effectual working of his power. Anytime you talk about the grace of God, you're talking about something that's very powerful. And if, in Acts chapter 4, verse 33, he said, With great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Number two. It's probably my favorite part of Romans chapter 5. Look at verses 6 through 9. Not only do we see the power of God's grace, but we see the price that was paid because of it. Okay? Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 9, he said, For when you were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. You know, he didn't die for people that were so friendly and wonderful and they just loved doing the right thing. No, he says, Christ died for us when we were ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die and per adventure for a good man some would even dare to die. You know what he's saying there? He said, well, let's just take a righteous man and see if anybody will die from him. I tell you what, they'll still doubt. There's something called self-preservation. If you see a man drowning in the water, you're going to think to yourself before you jump in and save him, right? Am I going to come out of this alive? That's what he's talking about. He may be the president of the United States or he, he may be the Pope, but still before we jump in that water, we're going to be thinking to ourselves, is it worth it for me to go and try to save this person? You see, for a righteous man, you think, yeah, I might do that. But then you think, well, he's not so righteous, but he's still good. And then you doubt even more. You think, well, I just don't know. You know, we began to reason with ourselves. We say, man, I, I barely even know that guy. I'm risking my life here. But you see, Jesus didn't think about whether a person was righteous or whether he was good. He didn't care. That's grace. You see, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. Friend, that's the price that was paid. Now, I want you to think about this picture that you see on the screen. You think about key words in the verse, such as without strength. When I was without strength spiritually, he did this for me. I think about the word ungodly sinners, wrath, enemies. You see, Jesus paid the ultimate price when we were his enemies. 
If that doesn't describe the nature of God's grace, I don't know what does. There was an advertisement on the side of a plumber's van. It said, there is no place too deep, too dark, or too dirty for us to handle. <laughs> they were going to get the job done. They didn't care what, what involved in the job. Jesus was the same way. Let me give you some scriptures and then I'm going to move on. I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 53 if you can. I'll, I'll meet you there in just a moment. I invite your attention there. And while, while you're turning to Isaiah 53, it's one of the most beautiful passages in the Old Testament. I want to share with you some, thing, some things in a rapid fire fashion. Let's talk about a price, okay? He did this for us when we were ungodly, when we were sinners, when we were without strength and so on and so forth. But I think about these verses, you know, and like uh, Romans chapter 5 and in verses 6 through 9, you see those uh, key words there. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, he said, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our word. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty, notice, might be made rich. Spiritual wealth is what he had in mind. That's a price. I think about this passage in Ephesians 1, 7. It says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches, the riches of his grace. What a price it was paid. His redeeming blood. Hebrews 2, 9, it says, We see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. For the suffering of death, he was crowned with glory and honor, that he might taste death for every man. And it said, By the grace of God, that he might taste death for every man. Edwin Landseer was a famous painter in the Victorian era. He was very good. He liked to hang out with all the rich people and he knew this very wealthy family. He was visiting with them one day and their daughter spilled a big pitcher of coffee all over the wall and it left a big stain. So anyway, they tried to clean it up, but there was this big coffee stain on the wall of this very expensive home. So he agreed to come back and he painted this beautiful painting on the wall right there. I mean, there was like a waterfall, beautiful flowers and plants. It was amazing. You see, he took something that was a mess and he made it into something good. What is God's plan for your and my life through his grace? He wants to take something that is a complete wreck. And it doesn't matter, you know, even if you grew up in the church, you can say, well, I grew up in the church. Well, <laughs> spiritually, we reach a point in our lives where if we don't accept the grace of God, we're going to be a wreck. It doesn't matter if you're raised in the church or not. And I'll tell you this, when our young people go off to college, they're going to start learning a lot of things. They'll start it learning in high school, but when they get off on their own, nobody's making them go to church. You know, nobody's checking on them, waking them up in the morning. They start hanging out with the wrong crowd. I'm going to tell you something, they're going to need the grace of God. Many of us have experienced what it's like to go away and to come back home. There was a high price paid so that we could go out and waste our substance with riotous living and come back and still be like a prince. The price is mentioned here in Isaiah 53. I want to quote it here to you tonight. It's one of the most beautiful verses in all the Bible. If I had to pick a favorite, I probably, I have several, but I would probably choose this one above anything else. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised and we esteemed him not. And surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Notice, and by his stripes you are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and yet every one he has turned into his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. <laughs> 
In verse 7 it says, He shall see the travail of his soul and he shall be satisfied. By, my, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. You know what that picture is? It's a king that went out to war and he conquered everything in his path and he got everything that was valuable and he brought it back home and he set it in front of the people. You picture that. Spiritually, that's what Jesus did. He, he went out to war. He battled against the worst enemy, the enemy of death. And he conquered all the good things that he could bring back. And he, he came back from the dead and he laid those gifts in front of people and he said, now what are you going to do with it? It's your choice. I've done all that I can do to this point. You see, he, he divided the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors. He bare the sin of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. I encourage you sometime in the next week to go back and read that and pick out how many times it says he did something for us. For instance, he bore our griefs, carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. It goes on and on and on. You see, that tells me, point number two, there is a price that is involved in God's grace. So not only do we see the power, we see the price. But number three, let's go back to Romans 5. In verse 10, there's a promise. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. It's interesting what's mentioned here in the 10th verse of Romans chapter 5, and I'll share it with you now. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. It was like a double promise there. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it says, not only were you reconciled by his death, but because he's living, you're, you're like double reconciled. It's a beautiful picture, God's grace. I have some verses I wanted to share with you tonight about what I found about the grace of God. I, I sort of had to put it in a puzzle. I, ha I had to put it together in my mind, so I wanted to share it with you tonight. Elizabeth Barrett she snuck away to marry a man named Robert Browning. Her father did not approve of this young man, so he disowned her. He told her, I don't want to have anything to do with you if you're going to be with him. So she moved to Italy. She wrote her parents every week. For 10 years, she wrote them a letter every week single week. She didn't miss one. After 10 years, she received a box in the mail and that box contained every single letter that she had ever sent her family and not one of those letters was open. I guess her daddy meant what he said. Those letters today are some of the most valuable English literature that we have on the face of the earth. I encourage you to Google Elizabeth Barrett Browning tonight and look up some of the famous poems and writings that are in the English literature books because of her. Some of the most sad, powerful English literature that you'll ever read. How many people today have have totally taken God's word. I mean, it's full of letters of love and of grace and mercy and they've been offered it time and time again, but yet they never open. See, I did that for a long time. But the more that I open those letters, the more I realize not only do I need it more every day, but I learn how strong it is. Something unique about God's grace. Let me share it with you. When you think about point number three, the promise of this grace, I want you to understand four things. Number one, we are saved by grace. I mean, the Bible plainly says it. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
There is not one thing a man can do to earn the grace of God, but it saves us. Number two, not only are we saved by God's grace, we stand in God's grace. Incidentally, we just read this in our text in Romans chapter 5. He said, by faith we have access into this grace wherein you stand. So I had to put this puzzle together, you know, and I thought, how can I, how can I relay this message? And I had to sort of put it in the way that I do this. You know, I always have everything begin with the same letter. So we are saved by grace. We stand in God's grace. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, we serve by grace. The Apostle Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. He even said, I labored more abundantly than all of the apostles. But it wasn't me. It was the grace of God that was with me. You and I, when we serve, we serve by the grace of God. Lastly, we're sustained by God's grace. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 and 9. The Apostle Paul had something in his life, and nobody knows what it is. It, it was something terrible. You and I are going to face terrible things, and we're going to pray to God. We're going to say, Lord, please take this from me, whatever it is. But the Apostle Paul prayed, and he said, three times I begged God. But he said, my grace is what sustains you. You're just going to have to go through it. You're just going to have to endure it and realize that my grace will sustain you through whatever it is that you're going through in life. And that's a promise. My grace will be with you. Number four, not only do we see the power of grace, the price of grace, the promise of grace, but I like this. In verse, verse 11 of Romans 5, there, there is a prize. Let's go back to Romans chapter 5. He said, not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now have received the atonement. What are some key words that describe the prize when you read that passage? Well, to me, I, I see the word joy. I see the word atonement, you know. Th these are really rewards that God has offered to mankind because of His grace. And I want to tell you, not one of us deserves it. But He gives it anyway. A little girl was adopted into a sweet family after being in foster care for six years. She fell in love with her new family and on her seventh birthday, the parents took her to Disney World. She experienced Magic Kingdom for the first time and she said, I cannot believe I got to come here. And it's not because I was good. It's because I belong to you. If there's anything that I feel like is a real life example of God's grace, especially to a child, it would be that. It's not because I was good. It's because I belong to Him. That's the reason why we have joy. That's the reason why we have the atonement. I want to end with two verses tonight. Chapter 5 and verse 11, he, he gives this word atonement. It's interesting. If you look at the meaning of this word, it's very special. I encourage you, if you do like word studies, you look at the background and the nature of this word. I think you'll be surprised what you come up with. I've even heard sometimes it's similar to the word mercy seat for the Ark of the Covenant. There's another word that's very strong in the New Testament is the word advocate. It's not closely kin to this word, but I would say it's, it's maybe a distant cousin. And in the book of 1 John, he said, I write unto you that you sin not, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You know what that advocate does? He, he makes atonement. He covers up the lawless deed of his client. That's what Jesus does. He does that because of his grace. So tonight, are you a Christian? Christian?
have you accessed the grace of God? You know, just because it's appeared to everyone doesn't mean that everyone will receive it. You know, I think about what the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 1 when he said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who hath called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another. There be some that would pervert the gospel of Christ. You know, that tells me that God's grace is found in the gospel and that, that if people do not accept what the gospel teaches about God's grace, then they can't receive it. Some people will pervert it. They'll change it. Timothy said, Paul said to Timothy, My son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ tonight? Are you willing to accept the power, the promise, the prize, all these things about God's grace that we talked about tonight? If you're willing to obey the gospel, friend, you're ready. But it's up to you. You know, there were people on the day of Pentecost who, who wanted to know what to do. Peter wasn't shy about telling them. He wasn't going to pervert the gospel of Christ. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Upon doing that, they obeyed the gospel. They were added to the church, verse 47, where they were put into Christ, where God's grace was found. Tonight, I hope two things. Number one, if you're not a Christian, I hope that you will think seriously about accessing the grace of God. Number two, if you are a Christian, I hope you'll be thankful. I hope that I'll be so thankful that God is allowing me a net to build that bridge. Will you come tonight if you have any need as we stand, as we sing?